Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of our mouths and the thoughts of all our hearts be now forever acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So as many of you will be aware, there's a lot of tension around Mobley at the moment uh, due to the development of a traveller site on the corner of Broad Oak and Town Lane. Uh, there was a number of public meetings held at the Victory Hall just this last week. Uh, I went to one of them, uh, where there was our local councillor, Charlotte Leach, and our MP, Esther McVeigh. And whilst I was waiting to go into the meeting, uh, a local resident asked me, in a jokey way, it was just a bit of fun, uh, a question along the lines of, well, what would Jesus do in relation to the traveller camp? Uh, now, I'm not aware that Jesus was ever involved in town planning or building decisions, uh, but we know that he was concerned with people and that he was concerned with community, but not necessarily in the way that we might uh, imagine or assume. I should have pointed them in the direction of that reading from Romans that we heard read by Angela earlier today, but I want to concentrate on Jesus' concerns. And our Gospel reading today is all about call and response. About how Jesus calls people to take up their cross and to follow him. And there are many examples of this given earlier in the Gospel when, for example, Jesus calls the twelve disciples to follow him. But I think it needs breaking down a little bit what is meant by call. Because when Jesus calls, it's not a simple, hello, it's not a, well met. Jesus' call is a call to action. A call very specifically to follow him. And so Jesus' call, as well as a greeting, is also a challenge. And it's a challenge, first of all, to repent. One of the things we're really good at is seeing the fault in other people. We're really good at criticising people for their various shortcomings, sometimes which are real and sometimes imagined. And not only are we good at spotting these flaws, we also tend to judge them to a far harsher standard than we do ourselves. Because we understand why we make mistakes. We don't understand necessarily why other people might. And so as Jesus says so wonderfully in Matthew 7, first, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbour's. So repentance is actually first and foremost about seeing clearly, about looking to ourselves and seeing ourselves as we really are, stripped of that veneer of maturity and sophistication and ego with which we normally clothe ourselves when confronting the world. And it's about recognising instead the vulnerability the neediness, the helplessness that so often lurks inside of us. And repentance is about seeing it, acknowledging it, and dealing with it through offering it to God. And by so doing, we might then be able to see these same things in the people around us, and so treat them with far greater understanding and compassion. So first of all, it's a call to repentance. Secondly, the call of Jesus is a call to detach ourselves from the things of this world. A few weeks ago, you may remember, we heard the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. And in that parable, Jesus speaks of the seed that falls amongst thorns. And he said, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, 
But the cares of the world and the law of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. So Jesus taught those who were to follow him to sit lightly to possessions and to the things of this world. And he also promises that everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So how often have we allowed our competitiveness and our jealousy to colour the way we think about another person's house or job or car? How many times have we allowed that to shape what we think about that person? But God judges by the heart, not the outward appearance. And the followers of Jesus must strive to do the same. So it's a call to repentance and to detachment from the world. But it's also a call to obedience. And obedience isn't simply mindlessly following an order. Any Tom, Dick or Harriet can issue orders. Obedience is fundamentally about accepting authority. Submitting to an acknowledged higher authority. And there is no greater authority than God. If we accept God for who and what God is, as revealed in Scripture as Creator and Redeemer and Sanctifier, then we have no other option than to accept His authority over us and over the world. There is that wonderful question posed in the Psalms, in Psalm 8, by someone who truly recognised the majesty of God. They wrote, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Such majesty deserves, indeed demands, obedience. Obedience that is not blind, for there is also a promised reward for obedience. Jesus says in Matthew 12, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Those who are obedient to Christ become part of a new family, a holy family, wherein we can call Jesus our brother and share in his inheritance as the Son of God. And so finally, as we heard this morning in our Gospel reading, the call of Jesus is also a call to take up our cross. And we normally see this as a, in purely physical terms, thinking of a cross as a, a burden that we have to bear. But that isn't what Jesus means by it. When Jesus speaks of taking up our cross, he isn't referring to the weight of it, but the meaning of it. In Jesus' time, the cross was nothing less than a symbol of death. And so when Jesus tells us to take up our cross, there are two levels of understanding. Firstly, to take up the cross is a willingness to accept death for Jesus' sake. This was a reality for Jesus' followers, many of whom were martyred. And it remains a reality for many Christians, many of our brothers and sisters in the world today who face persecution, imprisonment, torture and death. But there's a second layer of meaning to it. To take up our cross also means being willing to put to death those things in our lives that I've mentioned above. It means a willingness to put to death material 
desire, material wealth and comfort. It's about putting to death the need to have control over our own lives and our direction and giving those things over to God. As Jesus says in Matthew 16, when he again tells his followers to take up their cross, for what would it profit them if they gained the whole world but forfeit their life? And so this call of Jesus is a call to respond. It's a call to repentance. A call to detachment. A call to obedience. And a call to take up our cross. So what would Jesus do regarding the traveller camp? That's where I started. It's always good to come back to where you begin. Well, he would challenge us. He would challenge us and every person in the same way that he challenged people 2,000 years ago. He would challenge them to listen to his call. He would challenge us and everybody else to recognise God's authority over the world and over our lives. He would challenge us to examine our hearts. He would challenge us to obedience. And he would challenge us to serve his coming kingdom through service to God and one another. And everything else is actually pretty much irrelevant. What would Jesus do as a question provides an answer that costs far more than we would actually ever imagine.